Well, we'll get started here in another few seconds. I know people are rolling in from another event, but uh, excited to have everybody here and think about um, what the ground we've covered over the last few months. So, Got here right on time. So just a quick recap of who we have with us here today. 83% of you uh, identify with a forestry professional background, and we have a really nice mix of folks with experience in wildlife biology, conservation policy, public policy, and some of the interested public recreation related or all of the above. Um, folks have attended a variety of these webinars, which is also helpful. Um, let's see. Some people, a couple people are just joining us today, but many have been to one, two, three, or several, or even all of them. So thanks so much. And Aaron, take it away from here. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, this started off well over a year ago, and we kind of brainstormed this idea. And um, we were all dealing with the pandemic and trying to keep uh, keep folks engaged. And I guess we're, we're still a little bit in that situation now, but uh, I think this has been a great monthly series. So first, I, I welcome Amanda and Logan's involvement with the Forest Stewardship Guild. Um, and most importantly, all of you for attending. I think we've had a regular crowd and I think that's really been, been exciting. Um, I did just wanna remind people I know Meg has put out in the chat uh, about the webinar series. Uh, we are kind of, uh, I guess, making the rounds on the uh, community network uh, public channels on TV. So there is some viewership of this, but uh, the YouTube channel has gotten a lot of hits on the um, on the previous episodes. It has been a bit of a whirlwind tour. Um, we started off with Keith Canody and looking at uh, Safe Wood way back in October and have continued to talk through a variety of, of subject areas over the last couple of months. Many of the past panelists are joining us today. And so today, uh, Ivan Fernandez, who's been heavily involved with the Climate Change uh, Institute, as well as the Maine Climate Council, will lead us through kind of a guided discussion to reflect on the past webinar um, webinars and get some engagement with our previous panelists. So this is meant to be kind of a, a wrap up and summary. Uh, I'll introduce Ivan in a second, but probably needs no introduction. I did want to remind people that we've had a tremendous response for this webinar series, and we thought uh, we thought we were going to end it here uh, today, but, uh, but we've connected with some people working on Emerald Ash Borer, which is obviously a very important and emerging issue um, related to climate. And there's some great work being led by John Daigle and some of his graduate students at the University of Maine. And so we'd offer that June 2nd. So we will offer a bonus webinar. So hopefully many of you can join uh, for that um, discussion. I will uh, turn it over to Amanda at this point, but I want to just acknowledge Dr. Ivan Fernanda, Fernandez, who's been a great champion of climate change and a lot of the work that's been happening at the University of Maine for well over three decades. So uh, Ivan is a soil scientist, um, uh, but heavily involved with a lot of the things that are happening in Augusta these days. So welcome to the discussion and look forward to today's event. So thank you, Amanda and Ivan. Awesome, and thanks for the welcome in the intro. Um, just to quickly recap, um, while I share our second poll, um, this will help us help our panelists understand a little bit better where you what your knowledge is about climate and today's topic. Um, so again, we organized this series with uh, with the goals of stimulating conversations between researchers and managers, and sharing cross cutting cutting edge research in forest climate change. And we want to empower all of you, our participants, with some fresh ideas for actions that you can take to help Maine's forests adapt to the changing climate. Today's session is going to give all of us, including our panelists, a chance to reflect on the entire series um, with some of our great speakers who are going to help us address that question, where do we go from here? Oh, I meant to hit launch polling. I apologize. Um, so I'll uh, briefly, I'll give you just a minute to, uh, to complete this poll. Um, this will help our speaker and our panelists uh, decide um, how familiar are you with the Maine Climate Action Plan? Um, how familiar are you with the Maine Climate Council? Um, and also, uh, which of the webinar series that you participated in so far really resonated with you and your work? Um, so we'll just take a moment to do that. Um, while you're completing this poll, um, Ivan, do you want to give just a brief uh, intro to who our speakers are that are with us today's, today? I think you're on mute, Ivan. 
Um, I'm not sure who you want me to introduce. Or just uh, remind us who the speaker, who our panelists are that are joining well, us today. Panel, I'm not sure the full count. The, the panelists are um, our past experts that have given webinars throughout the entire series. And so for the second part of this, um, we'll have a panel. We're not going around with everyone making comment uh, necessarily, but because uh, we don't probably have time, but to uh, draw from our panelists some responses to three questions that I'll pose at the end of uh, my comments. Awesome, thank you, Ivan. So our panelists yeah. that are joining us have a variety of uh, variety of perspectives on forest climate change and forest climate adaptation science. Um, I'm gonna give you five seconds to complete this poll. Four, three, two, one, bink. Okay, so, so our panelists and everyone here is aware um, about half of you have heard of the Maine, Maine's Climate Action Plan. Um, over a third of you have even read parts of it, um, and three of you have read it cover to cover. So that's impressive. Um, how familiar are you with the Maine Climate Council? Uh, a little over half of you are aware of it. Um, a few of you know how it's structured. Uh, several would like to see a little bit more from the council. Some of you have even participated in council activities, and four of you are like, council what? So. We'll, we'll help you uh, understand a little bit more about that today. Um, wow. So what uh, what uh, webinar in this series particularly resonated with you? Um, the forest biodiversity and species shifts definitely is jumping out at us from January, but uh, there it seems like there was something in it for everybody, which is pretty exciting. So at this point, um, I'll let our panelists, you can go dark if you haven't already. Um, and Ivan is gonna give us a uh, introductory uh, presentation to kind of center the stage before our panelists uh, turn on again and rejoin us for the discussion. So Ivan, take it away. Great. Let me adjust this. You can see my screen. Correct. All good, Ivan. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, thanks uh, for everyone for being here. Thank you, uh, uh, Amanda, for uh, and, and uh, Aaron for the introduction. Um, and uh, I'm going to want the name and address of the three people that read the climate action plan from cover to cover because I think you could be valuable for the for the state. Um, so my title today is Converging Policy and Practice, Carbon, Climate and New Directions, which sounds like a title one would make up uh, a year ahead of when you were actually going to give the talk at the end of a really good webinar series. And that's exactly what it is. Um, so I, what I thought I'd do today is uh, uh, a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, walk through, just because I got a kick out of doing it, uh, a, a recap of the webinar uh, series that we've been on, the, the journey that we've been on, and uh, all of our great speakers. To my colleagues, the, the uh, experts that uh, uh, gave these talks, forgive me for uh, truncating your, your talk to a slide. Um, but I, I went through and, and just grabbed some highlights. Uh, that's part just to remind us the journey we've been on. Uh, that's also part to tell those who have not seen uh, or were not able to attend or see the recording of some of the webinars uh, that you might want to go back and, and, and view them because they were really uh, chock full of good information and, and um, uh, very well done. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time um, talking about a framework going forward. Um, that's the questions about the climate action plan, uh, focusing on, on uh, uh, forest aspects. Um, and then basically the second half of the, the, um, uh, the hour or a little less, um, we'll have a panel of those past speakers who could be here today um, to address those, those three questions. And um, these, these are just to recap some reflections from, uh, from our panelists and thank you panelists who are uh, are able to be here for uh, uh, for being here. Uh, while I'm doing the thanks, um, this entire series is everyone who has been to e at least one uh, of the webinars before this one uh, know that these people are the ones that have uh, made it happen. Amanda, Aaron, Logan, and, and Meg, a great, uh, a great big thank you for the, the work that you uh, have did uh, specifically with this webinar series in order to, to make it happen and uh, to, to put together the kind of information I think that a lot of the, the viewers that have tuned in have responded very positively to. So uh, let's do a quick uh, journey through the, uh, the webinar series. 
Uh, I'm going to have one of these for each uh, of the webinars. Um, and just to remind us uh, what we learned and also to highlight for those who weren't there uh, what they can uh, learn if they uh, go visit the, the website on the FCCI website. So first one was forest operations in a changing climate. Our own Keith Canody, the university forest manager, uh, was the, uh, the, the speaker. Um, he uh, gave us a presentation. He also had a a great video. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, uh, you start off with uh, Keith's wife uh, apparently has a convenient stress calendar for him based on winter temperatures above normal. So uh, I thought that was pretty interesting and, and maybe a, 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 a new tool for uh, lots of people, lots of natural resource managers for, for sure, particularly foresters. Uh, but uh, Keith focused on the operational goal of, uh, of his work to be extracting wood efficiently while minimizing um, in environmental and regulatory risks. Uh, and Keith also provided a, a, a nice framework about how to incorporate the reality of climate change in the, into the real world of, uh, of forest management um, with uh, three, uh, three components, uh, short-term planning, which is day-to-day -day, uh, sort of on the ground, real-time decision-making, uh, mindful of the climate reality and all of the other interacting realities. Um, a medium term that he thought of, talked about as being the harvest planning and then long term having to do with um, uh, infrastructure and, and technology decision making. Um, that, that webinar included the um, uh, video of uh, Keith um, uh, in, in the forest talking about uh, the kinds of decisions uh, in real time. Uh, I, probably really resonated with me in light of the pandemic, although uh, we, we spend a lot of time outdoors, but it, it's always a, uh, in, instructive and, and fun to follow Keith around and listen to him uh, talk about uh, the woods that he, uh, he knows so much about and, and manages so well. Uh, so I'm gonna start right off the bat and uh, give um, this webinar the blue ribbon for Keith's tour of the woods. Um, the second one, we learned about carbon and we, uh, lots of uh, us are all involved in uh, various aspects of carbon. Uh, we had a great webinar from our, our, our carbon pros, uh, Dan and, uh, and Adam. Uh, we learned about uh, calculating the carbon cycle here in Maine and uh, how kind of complicated it can be. Um, we learned about the outcome of the initial uh, evaluation of carbon cycle in Maine where forests are uh, the dominant carbon sink. Um, we learned about how forests can play a pivotal role in achieving cost-effective climate mitigation um, under the sort of a broad umbrella of natural climate uh, solutions. Um, we talked about carbon storage and durable forest products as being an important part of the strategy. Um, also noting that the uh, contribution of storage in carbon products is uh, is uh, notably smaller than the, the storage that's uh, on the stump at this point in time. Um, but I, I appreciated and, and highlighted here a point they made, which was that regardless of the forest contribution, uh, job number one is eliminating fossil fuel emissions. Uh, it has been, is, and, and will continue to be the most critical thing that we do uh, in the climate, our climate response. Uh, the third webinar was about warming um, uh, winters and, and changing winters uh, from Sarah and Jay. Uh, they talked about how tree physiology helps us understand um, the response of forests to changing seasons and, and uh, talked specifically about extreme events. Um, the, the issue about uh, the unknowns are having to do with uh, canopy tree resilience to climate. Uh, is an impediment to our ability to anticipate uh, large-scale change. Um, we learned about winter being, uh, uh, not maybe, it is changing faster than uh, any other season. Um, uh, and winters, uh, the minimums are warming faster than uh, the means and the, and the maxes and the consequences of that change for people, forests, and forest operations. Uh, talked about some of the specifics like the loss of the snowpack and how that can have uh, pretty profound impacts on soil freezing and, and changing uh, watershed hydrology. And we learned some new ter uh, terms uh, in the era of climate change. We're, we've 
uh, we're, we've become familiar with some of these terms that some of them have been in meteorology for a long time. Others are, uh, are new, polar vortex, bomb cyclone, marine heat waves. And now we have winter whiplash where um, uh, the uh, rapid extreme changes in the winter uh, have a, a, a synergistic and an outsized negative impact on, on people and ecosystems. Uh, webinar um, four was forest biodiversity and species shifts. Um, the poll demonstrates that this was a big hit and Aaron and Amanda did uh, a great job as usual. Um, some of the things we taught learned about were the um, what makes species vulnerable, particularly in Maine where we're in a uh, somewhat of an ecotone between the um, um, northern hardwood or uh, eastern uh, hardwood forests and uh, boreal and subboreal forests. Um, uh, they emphasize the importance of the interaction of, of more than just climate change, um, changing forests and fragmentation and uh, changing freshwaters and refugia. Um, with, with this uh, webinar, we looked at six case studies of climate effects for snowshoe hare and Canada lynx, moose, vernal pools, brook trout, alpine and Katahdin arctic butterfly, and the wood turtle and strategies on how to mitigate vulnerability of these uh, organisms to the, uh, to the climate stress. Um, and uh, they told us that forest management that fosters retention of native species diversity locally and forest connectivity regionally uh, imp provides important buffers to um, negative impacts on uh, uh, ecosystem services. Uh, webinar five, forest vulnerability uh, assessments from Melissa, Perry, and, uh, and Sandra um, emphasize the importance of uh, integrating biophysical and socioeconomic information um, into forest industry risk assessment, which is a, a focus of the project that they were, uh, that they have been working on and uh, were just uh, describing during the, uh, this uh, webinar. Um, they described how forest industry vulnerability assessments accomplished by evaluating uh, exposure uh, to, the, to the climate uh, stressor, uh, the sensitivity to that stressor, uh, and then the adaptive capacity um, uh, for a response and, and emphasize that negative impacts on climate change uh, on Maine's forest industry can be reduced via uh, enhancing that uh, that adaptive capacity. And um, the last point at which I completely agree, we still need to improve the, uh, the, the linkage between scientific information uh, and specific adaptation actions. And I think um, many on these webinars uh, that are viewers as well as the presenters are all pretty actively engaged in trying to, to fill that gap. Uh, Webinar number six was forest health and pests um, from Allison and Bill, um, two of our uh, experts on uh, in this uh, topic. We learned about the interaction between a climate and pest pathogen stressors and specifically uh, wet dunes and white pine needle damage, warmer winters and balsam woolly adelgid, the advance of hemlock woolly adelgid, drought and white pine decline, warmer winters, dry summers and beach scale survival and warmer winters and southern pine beetle. Uh, and they described um, using white pine and drought uh, as an example of um, this really important uh, uh, disease spiral I, I learned it many years ago, uh, but um, the interactions of the predisposing factors, inciting factors, and then finally the, the secondary components that are, are often what we think of as causing the, uh, the health concern when in fact it's a, a much more complex layered, uh, layered system. And then finally, last but certainly not least, um, Nick, Peter, and Walker uh, talked with us about uh, visualizing forest composition and health and particularly using some um, current technologies and emerging technologies for, uh, for accomplishing that. Uh, we learned about the use of forest remote sensing image analysis acquired by via UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, this is not delivering pizza or Amazon, but this is using them in the forests um, with mounted spectrometers and other air, airborne imagery sensors that can be uh, incorporated into ecosystem management that is uh, becoming increasingly important. 
um, in, uh, in forest management. Um, learn some practical insights uh, about SUAS, small unmanned aircraft systems, uh, what they can do to help us uh, understand forest condition, what they can't do, um, and the realities of what it takes to, to uh, use them. Um, and they focused or emphasized that these are new tools. These don't replace foresters, uh, but they have a tremendous potential to enhance our ability to, uh, uh, to manage and, and sense forest condition, which is uh, front and center in uh, managing our forest in, uh, in a, a changing climate. So th those that were there for all or some of them will recall a, a lot of that, uh, those components. Uh, where do we go from here? Normally, this is part of climate talks where I'm uh, launching into uh, putting together a, a, a strategy for adaptation and resilience. But, uh, you know, since last December here in Maine, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to uh, point to our integrated climate adaptation plan here in the state. Maine won't wait. Um, and it's the first integrated climate adaptation plan combining both mitigation uh, and adaptation. I know a lot of you have been involved in it, are central to it, um, but some of you uh, don't uh, aren't familiar with it. And so I'm going to give you a very quick uh, thumbnail of um, what the plan is, where it came from, and and um, what it in, what it entails or what it, it involves, particularly focusing on our topic here of uh, of forests. Uh, so the um, Climate Council is uh, a 39 member council that was signed into law by Governor Mills in June of 2019. Um, the council was charged with developing the Integrated Climate Action Plan, um, which is the cover of which we just uh, looked at in the last slide. Um, the, the 39 member council, however, is, uh, is uh, benefits from a, a huge amount of uh, engagement by a lot of people, and some of them uh, are uh, are on this this call. Uh, there's a scientific and technical subcommittee um, that's focused on providing the best available uh, science. The governor's been um, uh, pretty clear about the importance of basing uh, policy on the best available science, um, and particularly focused on Maine um, to uh, make it um, as as tangible and, and practical for decision making as possible. There's also a, a relatively new equity subcommittee that emerged after the equity assessment uh, process of, in the development of the, uh, the action plan. Uh, and both of those provide support for uh, the council as well as the work of um, the, uh, the working groups. And then so below here, the, the six working groups um, that, where's my laser? Um, had literally hundreds of people involved across uh, all the, all the major sectors that uh, would you would think be would be central to uh, a climate action plan: transportation, buildings, energy, communities, and emergency management, coastal and marine, and natural and working lands. And natural and working lands is sort of the heart and soul of the the forestry focus, um, but um, certainly elements of forests, uh, forest products, and forest industry and uh, and all of us that are uh, influenced by uh, that sector uh, span uh, essentially all of the working groups. So the uh, overarching climate action plan goals are to reduce Maine's greenhouse gas uh, emissions, um, to make Maine more resilient to the impacts of climate change, and so that's the adaptation uh, part, um, to foster economic opportunity and prosperity, uh, that's been uh, a key part of the plan going throughout. Um, certainly the pandemic, uh, which uh, landed in the middle of this process, um, uh, elevated us both to Zoom, as well as to the importance of um, the, our economic recovery. And you, know, you can't look at the news, uh, particularly this week, uh, without seeing that playing out, um, uh, but with a framework now in which to do that. And uh, also to advance equity through Maine's climate response, uh, likewise in the recent past in particular, uh, the issue of equity and social justice in, um, uh, in certainly in this country um, has become a priority. And so this plan becomes a, or is a, a, a comprehensive approach to 
essentially the, the transformative time in which we live. Um, probably a lot of you have seen this, but uh, very quickly, uh, this is Maine's greenhouse gas emissions as reported by the Maine Department of Environmental Protection in their biennial report. Um, the base year is 1990 in Maine, uh, the 20, 2004 mitigation plan um, targeted 10% below that, the 1990 level by 2020, but had no goals beyond that. Um, but we uh, peaked in the mid 2000s, uh, significantly below that now and met the target um, that was in place, but Maine's, uh, Maine Won't Wait provides now the targets going forward, which are for gross greenhouse gas emissions of 45% below uh, 1990 by 2030 and 80% below 1990 uh, by uh, 2050. In addition, and quite relevant to lots of the discussions around forests, the governor signed an executive order uh, that she actually announced in, uh, before the UN General Assembly um, to in, uh, in the uh, fall of, uh, of that year um, to uh, make carbon neutral, uh, make Maine carbon neutral uh, by 2045. So the Climate Action Plan um, has eight strategies. These eight strategies are an, an amalgamation, if you will, of many more recommended strategies that came up from the working groups uh, essentially in June of 2020. Um, and from that point to December of 2020, uh, the council uh, developed th these eight strategies, which by and large encompass um, all aspects that were uh, presented. Uh, but are, were formulated in a, uh, uh, this uh, eight point framework. I'm um, not gonna walk through all the details of all of those, of course, with, uh, the, with the time we have here. Um, I'll, I'll point out the, the first three are ones that focus on mitigation. And so uh, embrace the future of transportation. In Maine, 54% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from transportation. And so that's a high priority area. Essentially that's about primarily electrifying uh, our transportation in Maine. Um, about 30% comes from buildings. And so uh, modernizing Maine's uh, buildings through uh, weatherization and uh, installation of heat pumps are our key strategies to moving that one forward. Uh, and then re reuse carbon emissions from the energy sector, uh, increasing our, our, our renewable portfolio to 80% uh, by 2030 and 100% of our, uh, our generation uh, electric generation by uh, 2050. Uh, the last five um, uh, of the uh, strategies are focused more around um, adaptation, not exclusive to mitigation, um, and essentially the, our, the human capital. Uh, Grow Maine's clean energy economy is about doubling re uh, uh, clean energy jobs by uh, 2030 in the state of Maine. That's not just renewable energy, but that's also uh, bioproducts that, uh, that are uh, front and center. Uh, protect Maine's environment and working lands and waters, increase carbon sequestration. Um, I'll talk about that uh, more in a second. Um, build healthy and resilient communities, prime focus being uh, supporting communities and developing uh, strategies uh, to um, uh, respond to uh, climate change, uh, their own climate action plan, their own risk assessments, um, uh, which is, is taking place essentially throughout Maine. Invest in climate ready infrastructure, G, which is about doing a, a risk assessment in, in, through a climate lens for all of the infrastructure in the state. And the action plan, a lot of that, uh, a, prior, a priority in that uh, right out, off the uh, top is um, uh, addressing the, um, the new sea level rise predictions that came from uh, the Science and Technical Subcommittee uh, into um, uh, Maine uh, policy. And then uh, H is about engaging people, uh, informing people uh, from people that are kids in schools to communities, um, developing uh, a ready workforce for um, this new economy and, and the technologies that, that it will require. So, um, a lot there. All of this is on the uh, on the web on Maine Climate Council website, as well as all of the uh, background reports, as well as on the YouTube channel. All of the um, uh, all of the YouTubes to um, that uh, where these were discussed and uh, and, and presented. Um, given the focus of this uh, this webinar and the webinar series, I 
I, I sort of extracted what I think might be highlights of um, the forest forest sector uh, components of the plan, which is um, a really important part of the plan. Uh, and, and this is my short version, which would be to, you know, uh, the uh, a key part is uh, increasing conservation lands, working lands, uh, farms and forests uh, from about 20% to 30% by 2030, which is now consistent with the, the now federal goal of 30 by 30. Uh, we lose about 10,000 acres a year um, to development, and uh, that's uh, a pretty bad carbon strategy. And so uh, protecting these lands is, is really central and critical to uh, moving forward on the agenda. Um, accelerating forest product innovation, uh, new, new products uh, that are, are coming to market now and are in development, mass timber, cross-laminated timber, nanocellulosic, um, wood fiber insulation. Um, these are really exciting areas that uh, for Maine's forest product industry and, and this plan uh, focus on, it focuses on them uh, front and center. Uh, and enhanced markets for all forest products, not just the new ones. Um, and then valuing forest carbon. We could write a book about that. And a lot of you are, uh, are uh, experts and engaged uh, on this, but a tremendous focus on uh, how can we uh, increase our carbon storage in our forests, in our forest products, um, but also enhance forest resilience uh, and how do we assure that we're actually doing what we, we think we're doing. Um, a lot of energy in this space and, and with more to come, uh, there's a task force working on that with um, deliverables by this September uh, as well. Uh, wider implementation of CHP, particularly in the industry, combined heat and power, really uh, important uh, uh, approach that gets the most uh, out of uh, some of our uh, wood, wood fiber. Um, and uh, uh, an emphasis on uh, uh, resources being invested into uh, technical support for forest managers and landowners. Um, and, and my last bullet here really is, is not directly from the plan, but it's just reflecting that um, this is really an unprecedented time for a focus on uh, natural resources in the context of climate and economic development, um, and, but particularly in our forests. And uh, Maine is 89% forests and um, sequestering right now 75% of uh, our greenhouse gas emissions in, in, in carbon uptake and products. Um, uh, it, it is front and center. And we, uh, I, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for these kinds of discussions that we've had in the webinar series and for the engagement that I know a lot of you are involved in um, using the best information, uh, having the tough dialogues, getting it right, uh, but taking advantages of this uh, important time. And so um, I'm gonna wrap up uh, quickly here with this uh, uh, second to last slide. I guess. Um, you know, where are we going forward, looking uh, forward with this action plan? Um, the council's developing metrics of uh, uh, various accomplishments so we all can uh, tune into the website and, and keep track of its, uh, its progress going forward. Um, there, there's a quarterly uh, meetings of the Maine Climate Council ongoing. Um, the Maine Department of Environmental Protection will continue to issue its biennial emissions report of greenhouse gases. Future reports will have uh, additional aspects of, of the data that will assist in the, this uh, exercise. Uh, working groups and subcommittees uh, will continue to meet. Uh, they meet twice a year and are engaged in various aspects of uh, assisting with uh, implementation at this point, um, but also all are involved with looking forward because the uh, action plan is updated every four years. And so in 2024, um, we expect a uh, uh, an update of the current climate action plan and, and uh, the various components of the council are uh, already engaged in discussions of how do we, how do, we do that? How do we um, even improve on our process and how do we move this agenda forward? Um, and right now there's a buzz of activity in the legislature and in state agencies and um, essentially in towns and communities across the board um, uh, moving this forward. So that's, that's kind of looking forward um, here in Maine uh, and a reflection of the, uh, the action plan that we have. Um, and, and what we wanted to do now is, uh, so this is the last slide, um, pivot to our panel. And um, as I uh, described earlier, uh, 
those who could be here of our past experts um, are uh, comprise the panel. We're going to do it one at a time, but I'm just going to show this slide and then I'm going to get off the, the screen so we can see everyone. Um, I'm going to pose three questions uh, one at a time. Uh, what do you think are the greatest risks for forests, forested landscapes, and forestry due to climate change? What do you think are the most exciting opportunities brought by climate change and our response to the climate crisis? And what do you think are the highest priority information needs to enable effective solutions? And so I'm, I'm going to drop this and open it up. I'm going to put these questions in the chat uh, one at a time. Uh, but then uh, Amanda is going to be tracking uh, if the uh, folks in the viewers uh, have uh, questions and input, please put it in the chat. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to open it up to our panelists. Let me get off the screen and shut up now. There we go. Um, and I'm going to, let me drop this. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Ivan. Sure. Um, so at this point, I'd love to invite our panelists who are present to turn on your cameras if you're able. I believe we have Amanda Cross, we have Sandra, Nick, Alyssa, Aaron, Sarah, Dan, I think we have Peter, uh, and Adam. So if you're able to turn on your cameras and join us, that would be wonderful. Um, I did post all of the questions in the chat. Uh, so our panelists can oh, get an okay. extra an extra look at them. Um, so again, uh, I think um, Ivan, you wanted to, you wanted uh, to start by sure. posing these to the panelists, and I will keep an eye on the chat window for any uh, participant questions that might be woven into that discussion. Okay, great. So um, why don't we start with number one? And and I, I think I can see you all. So just you know, wave at me or speak up. Or um, uh, what do you think are the greatest risks in, in the context of this forest discussion for um, as a result of climate change? I'll go. go ahead. All right. Adam. So um, you talked a lot at the end, Ivan, about you know the council and the state and all our goals to be carbon neutral and the role of forests and all that, right? And so a big uh, component of that is having trust the forest is going to continue to sort of grow historically, and we're going to sequester more than basically we cut or release, right? But with climate, it can be uncertain, basically what what those growth and yields might look like which can then basically affect really sort of what trajectories we might be on under a range of conditions, let alone sort of socioeconomics or anything like that. So um, understanding, better understanding, I guess, those effects would, would, would help us feel more confident that, that we are, again, on the, on the right track towards achieving some of those goals. Yeah, yeah, totally. Great. Do you think, Adam, that, that we're expecting too much from our our forests in everything that we demand from them in fiber and recreation and wildlife and and now carbon too or are we going to be able to to balance or get all of these things from our forests right so i think with the status quo we might be right but again my perspective as an economist and sort of through that lens is that with the right instruments and the right influences, like we as humans have the ability to adapt and sort of help speed up the forest and adapting to what our needs might be, right? But we have to get the signals right so that we're not pulling people in 15 different directions, right? And so, you know, we can model out stuff and say it is possible to increase carbon and to have a diverse forest structure for biodiversity and, and in a way at least maintain the fiber needs, right? But but the current state of the forest isn't going to allow us to do that. We are going to need sort of more incentives and, and, and more technical expertise to basically achieve all those sort of potentially synergistic opportunities. But, but sort of, again, with the status quo, they can, they can tend to be sort of competitive in their, in their use and, and need. Great. Other thoughts on risks? I will add uh, some in some discussions with foresters and through our own research, we found that insects and pathogens are perceived as a really large risk to our forests. Also, extreme precipitation events and changing winters, you know, reduced snowpack. And I think you talked a little bit about this, Ivan and, and Sarah and Jay as well have, have talked a lot about that. Great. Other thoughts? 
I guess, yeah, building on that, Alyssa, that, that's a good point that we can even say, like, this is the type of manager we should do, right? And you should go in and you do this type of operations. But if you can't physically get into the forest in certain parts of the year to, to do what we think should be technically sound, right? that's another thing that makes it easy, sound great through a sort of from a technical expertise perspective, but but stood, could still be something that, that we can't overcome with the sort of current equipment and, and, and knowledge that we have. I guess I would sort of throw in there that I feel like we can sort of fill some of these knowledge gaps about the the risks on the ecology side, but I worry that we're going to struggle to incentivize a shifts in behavior that align with that enough to move the dial so that we can deal with the ecological side of the risks once we determine what that's most likely to be. So we could fill the knowledge gap all we want. And I, I have faith in our ability to do that and this group's ability to do that. And But what we do with that information is where, where I worry about. And just to follow what Erin uh, said, uh, some of the work that we have been doing with, with Alisa uh, is trying to understand how our stakeholders and users are accessing that information, what that information means and translating that knowledge into actual behaviors. It's, it's more complex than we think as, as sometimes, but it's just generating biophysical science Mm -hmm. um, so certainly we need to keep enhancing our communication tools. We keep, we need to generate more data to better understand what are the barriers to adaptation? How can we increase the capacity of the stakeholders to be able to use that information and convert it to specific actions that will help them manage the forest? Great. I concur. Other highlight risk categories before we. If I can add a few comments from the chat window, um, trying to weave this in because what I've heard so far from our panelists is a little bit about risks, a little bit about opportunities and a little bit about some priorities. So we're kind of getting at all of those yeah. questions, which is exciting. Um, so some specific issues that folks have raised. Uh, one participant asked about uh, silvicultural techniques that are recommended to alleviate the effects of climate change, thinking about eastern white pine and kind of the, the, the forest health threats that are impacting eastern white pine, our state tree. Um, there was another panelist that, or sorry, another participant that raised invasive species and wants to, was wondering what's needed to recognize the threat that that poses to our forest and improve resources. So that gets a little bit of what Sandra was just mentioning, changing behavior, what's needed to uh, empower and change behavior. And another participant, uh, said that you know informing and engaging the public is definitely a priority so a uh, few more great. issues to throw into the mix great great I, I should remind everyone uh logan is behind the scenes taking notes and so he's going to synthesize this and it will be even more brilliant than it sounds right now um so uh, all right why don't why don't we go to question number two but uh, obviously it's free range of comments uh, so um, opportunities that really jump out relative to climate change and our response to um, the questions expressed, I wrote it, but uh, the climate crisis, um, but that doesn't, uh, the, the opportunity side obviously is about uh, the positive aspects of how we respond. So what jumps out uh, as opportunities in this era we're in? Go ahead and state the obvious too. Sandra. Well, if, if I may, um, some of the things that we've learned through the interviews and engaging with the forestry professionals is that uh, they perceive that the longer growing seasons, higher CO2 emission, uh, CO2 concentration, sorry, and drier summers may be beneficial in terms of increasing forest productivity and harvesting. So seeing climate also as potential, climate change as potential opportunities. And um, also some of the work that we've done, I think, suggests that there may be possibilities to continue to enhance collaboration across subsectors. So how can we use, uh, how can we rely more on, on the forest products industry or subsector to generate new products? Um, and how could that collaboration enhance adaptive capacity? Great. 
Adam. Yeah, so building on that, um, some conversations that we've also had with, with um, various landowners, stakeholders has been just to acknowledge that by in some way having carbon markets can help commoditize another aspect of the forest that can generate revenue sort of in the more sort of near term relative to waiting for particular harvest ages to come up and things like that, which can actually, a lot of people are looking at that as opportunities to enhance management that can be more adaptive um, in the sense of because there's greater cash flow. So that too can lead that, that a lot, many perceive that they have the technical know-how or know where to go to, but they don't actually have the cash flow opportunity to execute, particularly in the sort of short to medium term. So that adding that extra sort of value to the forest that's being recognized explicitly through carbon markets might might allow this adaptation process to to happen more more rapidly and efficiently yeah great others go ahead amanda i have sort of a, a very baseline one but i think that's incredibly important as is at least through my work with wildlife i think there's a greater shared public understanding of the role of managed forests and a, a greater sort of you know, general appreciation for the role of, of forests, both managed and unmanaged, as a climate solution, and also the incredible co-benefits that come out of those systems, both for human health, whether it be mental health over the last year of COVID, mm -hmm. um, but also in, in terms of thinking about the co-benefits to biodiversity. So I think, you know, it's, it's a very generalized statement, but I do feel like the climate crisis has really kind of brought to the forefront the role of main forests and, and forest management in addressing many different needs. I think that does get back to Adam's earlier point about, you know, asking too much of the forests and, and then also Sandra's point about how to provide information that allows people to weigh what they can do or, or can't do within their own, their own scope of influence. So, so let me do, do you think that there's more uh, or, or improved public awareness of the challenges for managing, you know, biodiversity in the state, uh, in, in the context of forests or otherwise, um, as a result of what's going on in, from from a climate response. I guess, Ivan, what I was thinking was, and thinking about the Climate Council's reports of just the amount of carbon that is stored and sequestered in in our forests currently. Oh but also yeah. in the forest products that are produced and how that you know, in and of itself, I think is a, is a huge um, new piece of information that maybe wasn't, wasn't sort of on the radars of the general public. And I feel like that, that's kind of heightened the importance of understanding our forests and then bringing in the role of biodiversity as well in maintaining wildlife populations and balancing that with the role of carbon storage and forest products and everything else. And thinking about that, how do you do that both now and then into the future as well? So I think, you know, it's it's uh, it's kind of brought forth the importance of the forest that we have here in Maine generally. Yep. Yep. Great. I agree. Other thoughts on opportunity? I'll, I'll jump in, uh, Ivan. Yeah. I, I think similar to what Amanda was saying, that there's just really one opportunity that there's greater engagement, I think, by everyone in in this in science uh, and in management and also in, in policy around climate change. And I feel like yeah. there's there's better interdisciplinary science happening that includes you know the biophysical and and social sciences and 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 then being utilized to inform management and management is being more explicitly forward looking and, and explicitly addressing uncertainties. And then all this is leading to better policies as well for, for people and for forests. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I'm, actually, I'm gonna put Aaron on the spot because he's, he's, he's trying to read something. And uh, Aaron, um, A-A-R-O-N, Aaron. Um, I, and we're thinking about opportunities. Uh, I guess I'd ask you to just reflect for a minute on, on the whole issue of, of bioproducts and, and the, the era that we're in and the focus and you're involved, you know, in for Maine and, and other activities have really uh, ramped that up. Um, is that, uh, it's perceived as being a time of uh, increased focus on, in, in a positive way on development and uh, of that uh, technology as well as those markets, would, would you agree? 
yeah, I think Ivan, I really feel for the first time in, and I won't say my long career, but at least the time I've been in Maine and in forestry, um, the narrative is finally somewhat positive um, in that we can achieve these multiple benefits, thinking about green products and thinking about how we sustain and support kind of that rural culture of the communities like those in Northern Maine. I know there's a lot of activity happening right now in Washington DC around climate change and carbon. So I think the incentives that Adam is kind of highlighting are, are realistic. And I think they support the idea of good long-term sustainable forest management that, that we've practiced here in Maine. Um, definitely a little bit different story in areas that are dominated by plantations. And I think it gets to kind of those other benefits of, of a larger working forest landscape that, that Maine has demonstrated. So I think it gets back to one of Rogers Merchant's point of uh, communications to the broader public and, and kind of to forest managers who are making the decisions. And that's, I guess, some of the input that we would welcome is, is how can we tell a good story and get it to the right people. Yeah. If, if I can jump yeah, in yeah, with, go a, ahead. Anyway. Sorry, with a, oh, that's okay, with a chat box comment. Um, so building off of what Aaron just said, um, how do we change the civil cultural status quo in the Northeast? We have so many foresters on, on today's webinar. Um, so changing the civil cultural status quo from what can be described as more single age or single species focus to increasing forest diversity, which is part of forest climate adaptation. How do we change that uh, status quo and behavior and getting people to see and think about the forest differently? Good, good question. Who wants to answer that? You can see what the economist said. <laughs> I mean, in all the talks that I've had, people are like, we, we know how to do it. We know we, 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 there's, you know, it's not necessarily about an information gap, at least for the, you know, the foresters and silviculturists. It's just, we need the right incentives and the right signals to be able to do what, what can be achieved on the ground and what, what the know-how is there. But if, if the signals aren't there, then it's hard to implement what is quote unquote right, because ultimately forestry, you know, particularly at a larger scale is driven, driven by finances and economics. Um, you know, that's a key component. It's not the only component, but, but if you need to make a bottom line, you know, you're going to have to focus on what, what you can do in the short term to, to achieve that. I think just to link on that, I mean, in the last two weeks, we've seen a lot of large corporations now are thinking about sustainability and carbon footprints. And I think not only is it educating the general public, but it's also educating corporations that don't understand natural resources traditionally. Um, and I think that that's, that's an important new area that, that we have to think about as well. Great. Great. Um, I'm, I'm gonna pivot. We don't have to change the momentum here, but uh, if we would like to um, add the third question, which had to do with uh, information needs. You know, what do we need to know? What a priority research or monitoring or uh, other in that category? Um, and so, if everyone has some reflections on that here for the last few minutes before I turn it back to Amanda. Thoughts? Ms. Oh. Yeah, this this is where we would welcome audience participation as well. So we yeah, we... I'm right. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, deferring to the audience if they have anything. Um, you knew I'd bite on this question. Yep. I feel like a big one is um, we don't really have, and we're just starting to have some better monitoring data for forested sites. Most of the climate information comes from weather stations that are in the open. Most of Maine is forested. Um, and kind of combined with the shifting seasonality piece that we talked about in our webinar, as well as others uh, looking at changing winters. I don't think we really understand what the future will look like given possible feedbacks, given what uh, we might see as patterns if we had different networks of um, weather monitoring. So I think we really do need continuing long-term monitoring, as well as being sure that we're collecting data and designing research in places that are relevant to forests. Um, Maine has varied topography. We've got mountains, we've got places that we don't really have much data. So, um, you know, more data is always something that we say, but I think it's really warranted in this case. 
to understand what we are really going to be facing in the future and the velocity of change. Yep, great. I totally agree. I think that that's something that we have been uh, reflecting a lot on is uh, following up on what Sarah said. Uh, we do need data, but it seems like uh, the stakeholders, what they're seeking for is data that is relevant at, this, at a scale that they can understand and manage and scale in terms of the space, but also the time. And how do we link that to the other social science information that we're generating? Good point. I see good comments in the chat, so that's great as well. And, and again, Logan is taking note of that. And that's one thing that we'd like to come out of this webinar series is, is a nice summary like Ivan gave, but also some clear priorities and recommendations as we move forward. Yeah. So I, I think I'm going to turn it back to you, Amanda, for the sake of time here. And I'll go off duty. Thank you. Thank you, few fellow panelists. And thank you, everyone, for your comments in the chat. It's all yours. Man, we need like two hours and we definitely need to meet in person for this next time we have a, a panel. I, I'm barely keeping up with the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your questions. Thanks to our panelists for this really rich discussion. I'm hoping that while this is sort of wrapping up our series to date, that this will be sort of a look forward to what can we do together with all this information? What comes next? Um, so participants, something that can where you can help us answer what comes next. Um, we're wondering how interested will you be in some kind of a 2021, 2022 webinar series and what topics resonate with you? So please take a moment to, to fill this out. Um, I am still honestly processing all the great conversation from our panelists and from the chat, um, I see that there's a clear need uh, to keep the conversation going so we can turn all the science that we have into the, the practice uh, through the lens, at least here in Maine, um, of the, the Climate Council's work. So um, again, huge thank you to everybody. Um, yeah, we have heard a lot in the panel discussion here about um, the need for kind of a combination, it's complex, combination of social science solutions, uh, economic solutions, and maybe incentives, um, a little bit of clarity on adaptive silviculture, potentially in some specific systems that really helps us get toward climate resiliency and will help keep our forests stronger. Um, hopefully together, we can work on developing some of those solutions. Um, in the last minute, I'm gonna give you another five seconds to fill out that poll. Three, two, one, sorry, everybody, pink. Okay, so um, for all folks that are here, uh, uh, most are all in and can't wait for the next webinar series. Uh, almost the remainder are, uh, are looking forward to seeing the agenda first. We'll work with you on that. In terms of topics, I think that all of these are winners basically. Um, more about shifting forests uh, definitely is standing out. Uh, carbon mitigation management for conservation is another popular topic. More about warming winters, high impact weather events, um, and also stuff on specific tree species. So, um, and again, feel free to type additional thoughts into the chat window. Uh, we have about a minute left. Um, less than that before we get to officially let everybody go. So please join me in a virtual thank you to everybody um, for participating through our panelists, to Ivan, to Aaron, to Meg, to Logan, for putting this together, to everybody for being part of this. And as you saw, please join us for our bonus next, our, our bonus webinar. Um, there's more to come. So thanks everybody and bravo to our panelists. <laughs>